Jordan. I, well. Chortle. 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 All right. How are we doing today? We're doing good. We're doing good. Good. My name's Ian. My name's Jeremy. Jeremy today. Okay. Well, mm-hmm. that's fine. Mm-hmm. So, Jeremy. Yeah. What are we doing here? Why are we here? Well, do you want to talk about your campaign? Oh. Want to talk about that? Sure. We could do that. Uh, I didn't know yeah. you were part of my yeah. campaign, Jeremy. Do you play D and D, Jeremy? I was. I was watching. Oh, okay. Well, in from the shadows. So yeah, I was. I was looking. Like we always have been doing lately, all a little update on my campaign that we call Forged, and they're in a section that I just refer to as the Elves. Mm-hmm. And the uh, last session was great for me, and it seemed to be great for the players. Uh, everyone seems to be kind of working with the the new way. I'm trying to wrangle the kittens because mm-hmm. they all love to talk and everyone loves to be part of everything it was a little more out of control but i think there were a few players missing so we played it a little looser so by the time everybody was at the table it was a little it was a little hectic by the end yeah by the end for sure yeah um i think that some people uh because we kind of switched to that raising the hand thing mm-hmm. and i think that that's People are slowly going to start getting used to that. But I loved how some of the people were like putting their real hand up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, what you, just click the button, man. Well, the button is helpful because it moves your screen. So it's very noticeable that something has changed. Where if yeah. you're just raising your hand, it's just movement on your screen. It's not, it's hard to pick up on. Right. And it doesn't draw your eye at all. Yeah. It's tricky. Yeah, it's tricky. But it was a great time. I, as a DM, I really enjoyed what the players did. I enjoyed Mm -hmm. the boss fight that I had set up. It felt good to me. I feel like everyone tried their best to do what they did, and it was cool. Uh, As a player, Jeremy, or an observer, I guess. What did you think? Uh, I thought it was it was fun to see and watch (laughs) with my eyes from the shadows. I especially like the character of Cog. It was entertaining. Oh, you liked Cog, huh? What did you like about Cog? To play, to play watch. To play watch. Mm-hmm. To watch play. To watch play. No, but I liked uh, my character in that as Cog. He's a forged, uh, forged being. That's what we're using as a race, but I don't think he's really a war forged in terms of what he is in in your homebrew world. Mm-hmm. But I just really like I like the spin of him not having emotions but being fascinated by them. Right. So it's this whole I get I get to do things that in any other context would be unacceptable. Right. Oh, absolutely. But uh, it really works, and I'm starting to flavor his magic more in terms of like a forged being. So he has like uh, there's like a sanctuary spell mm-hmm. where like uh, he has this aura of thirty feet in diameter around him and uh he can heal people as a bonus action uh, he can heal his party members and uh having it be like a little drone that he throws up in the air and starts to spin rather than like just a magic spell right it's fun to do that i loved how when we were talking about spell components mm-hmm. and in this world with a section that we're in because it's like highly influenced by a magic that seems to be like space magic these characters don't really need components they're able to pull those elements just out of whatever Mm -hmm. but i loved Mm -hmm. how cog almost like utilizes something inside of it to grind up or do something with the components inside of itself to create the magic i thought that was Mm -hmm. so great yeah well i noticed that a spell i use a lot i'm supposed to have diamonds and i was like oh shit because if it if your spell description says that it actually uses a component that costs money costs gold you're supposed to you can't use a spell focus for that right right and just rules is written so i was like oh shit i just realized that let's point it out and then ian's like ah don't worry about it so i'm like all right well i'm gonna say that something you can hear something grinding inside so later on we can always open it up and discover that oh cog needs to go get this resource or oh yeah you know just giving the dm little little gifts little things to use in this world that we're living in in my campaign there is a place that literally like in the winter just like sprouts diamonds everywhere Mm -hmm. so due to like i said this space magic area and how they're so close to like being just exposed to outer space Mm -hmm. there's a lot of 
things that have changed and how close they are to that energy of that we've been just calling the vault of glass, which is actually a stolen from destiny. If anyone's listening, I stole that from destiny. Absolutely. I figured that. Well, especially one of the characters has a weapon named the Gallahorn. Right. And I messaged Ian. I was like, Gallahorn, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Wonder where you got that from. So I have a serious question. Sure. In your world, what's your world? It's just called the dome. What are we calling your world? The the area that exists in the dome is called that one place. That one place. That's right. Um, are diamonds a girl's best friend? No. In that one place? No, not, They're not? Absolutely not. Oh, well, that's too bad. People really, in this world, the things that we think of as mundane or cheap is what's rare there because everything's so abundant that comes exotically or fantastically right so like copper is the most valuable of the ores is like platinum right. basically exactly yeah. so like that's right basic like sandstone or really really common rocks would be like sought after so that would be like mm. the girl's best friend if you had like a sandstone is a girl's best friend is that what you're trying to tell me that'd be one of them yeah sandstone or interesting i'm trying to think shale or sticks St- the sticks i mean those are common yeah, those are common <laughs> that's wood dead dead wood but dead wood would be definitely prized because a lot of the there's a lot of magic that would keep stuff alive mm-hmm you know, the woods, the plant life, the shrubberies. So, yeah, it's shrubberies. Things that are in the. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> I hate you so much. <laughs> uh, I know. I know. Um, but I like the idea. And again, just planting seeds now for later on if we ever get to it. And we may not. But the idea that Cog doesn't need food, but every once in a while he has to just like down a bunch of gears or like rusty metal or he needs some kind of resource that he has to use to repair himself. So I like that idea that he needs something that works as maybe spell components and food and parts for repair, like for his steel defender. But it's not something he needs all the time. Mm -hmm. But I like that idea that he does need certain things to function he he's not it's not just a perpetual motion machine that yeah, yeah, yeah. is going to work forever uh without any any uh fuel so to speak yeah absolutely you know? we can yeah i i love that you're into that because i could definitely use that to do some fun stuff yeah in the game i like resource management me too i think it's fun when it has to do with my character so we've talked about that before mm. um, but i'm down for it so nice i love that down to down to clown down to clown so, uh, Ian. Yeah. What are we talking about today? Well, Jeremy. Uh, can I can I have Eric back, Jeremy? Is that cool? No. All right. Well, Jeremy. But you can call you can call me Eric. I guess. Oh, that works. Okay. All right, Eric. Jeremy. Jeremy. <sighs> Eric. I hate All it. All right, Jeremy. We are going to talk today about the art of D and D. Historically modern, just. All of the things that have gone into... What about subjectively? No. Empirically? I want to go ahead and say maybe. Scientifically? Yes, totally. Religiously? Never. Oh, God. Okay, fine. All right, now we've got the parameters. Now, I know that Eric has uh, a lot of good... in. Uh, sorry, Jeremy has a lot of good stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm going to definitely pass it to Jeremy here to start us off. Because I've been talking for a long time. <laughs> That's hilarious that you think that. Okay. Um, there's a few sources that Ian and I both used to research for this episode. And normally that doesn't actually happen. We usually have our own sources that we're going to to prep. And we might have like, you know, Ian, when we did our campaign worlds, Ian had a campaign world that was different than mine. So our sources are going to be different. With this, it was actually, there were really two big items that we used. And the first one was a documentary called Eye of the Beholder, which is about the history of the art of D&D. So it goes all the way from the beginning when uh, TSR was founded and takes you up pretty much to the modern day. It's a little dated now. I think the principal filming was done in like 2015, so right when 5e was coming out 
Oh, okay. It could be a little later than that, but I don't think by much. Okay. So it's slightly dated. Um, there's a lot of books and art that have come out since that are uh, very influential, like Xanathar's Guide to Everything, Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes, and books like that. Things of that nature. Yeah. The other source was uh, the History of D&D book that Wizards of the Coast has released, which is called Art and Arcana, or Arcana, depending upon how you want to pronounce it. And it's similar to Eye of the Beholder, but it has a lot more of the history of D&D contained in it. So you get a lot of the cool art, but also what was going on. So for instance, you get a good blurb on the satanic panic in the 80s and how that affected D&D. And, yeah. and it's it's uh, interesting to, again, when we take it back to stories, how the satanic panic now has been completely debunked. So it was basically just a story that people were telling themselves and how severely it affected some people's lives oh yeah people went to jail for crimes they didn't commit because of this story about satanists playing D D and abusing children it's really crazy when you look into how extreme the stories were you know well for sure we're for our podcast here we're going to talk about the art in different eras yeah and it's not really how anybody else is going to define it and i'll break it down in a little bit but it's uh it's going to be helpful for our conversation in this podcast today so the 80s is really known as the golden age of D. &D. Uh, it's when advanced dungeons and dragons and i think 89 is when second edition ad and day came out mm, okay i could be wrong it could have been 90 or 91 but right around there um and that's where the really prolific artists came out. They're known as the Four Horsemen. We're going to get into them because uh, a lot of the art that Ian and I came up with is from these four gentlemen. Oh, it's so good. Really good. So good. It's it's very apparent that they had they didn't know what they were doing. It was just, in a lot of ways, it was a job, a job that they really loved. But it was just like, yeah, we get paid to like paint dragons, and it's really cool. Right. I really love hearing... Um, Larry Elmore talk because he's kind of got that southern accent yeah. and he's just super cash about everything. Um, he's great. One of the guys, uh, now that you're saying that, one of the guys that talks quite a bit in the documentary that I didn't realize who he was until a good chunk in mm -hmm. is Todd Lockwood. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize how influential his art was on my D&D &D experience until it started finally showing his art. And I was like, oh my God. I, you know, I'll... Obviously, we'll keep getting, we'll do, I'm jumping the gun. Oh, no, you're you're fine. And he was one of the main guys of what I'm, again, this is just my term for our episode here, uh, the second Four Horsemen. Oh. So the four main people for third edition, he's one of the main guys. Nice. And that's when you get uh, like Wayne Reynolds and some of these uh, really big artists now. They, they got their start when Wizards really took over. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, Todd Lockwood is one of the, the big, big dudes for sure. Big boy pants. Another crazy thing. This is jumping the gun a little bit, but it really blew my mind when I first learned about it is we almost lost all the original paintings. We actually did lose, I think like almost two thirds. There's a huge chunk. Yeah. There's a huge chunk because when TSR went out of business, they just started chucking paintings in the, uh, dumpster and my takeaway from it was at a certain point TSR is like hey we should own all this like we're not going to let the artists keep their paintings I think that was a bad move yeah I think the artists would have taken much better care of the art for how things were run oh absolutely but TSR you when you look at the history it was just bad decision after bad decision so many like it's a miracle they lasted as long as they did because it's really kind of this story of corporate greed in a lot of ways and and having you know uh micromanaging where you have you bring in managers who don't in, understand anything about D, D or art or creatives uh trying to control creatives essentially it's, it's very crazy right well and those these people they bring in are like managing offices and like corporate stuff but they don't have any idea on how to what this stuff is that they're trying to manage and you know the golden age of D D from an art perspective was really fast and loose like oh, yeah. everybody was in a bullpen and they could work the hours they wanted to work it's similar to what you hear about the early days of disney animation studios where 
look, just get your projects done and you can work how you want to work. And that's the ideal situation. Yeah. Like, let me do the things in the way that makes sense to me. Right. And I'll get the work done, you know? 100%. So that's still just, it blows my mind that even if you're not like, okay, like we got to clear out this space. If I saw a bunch of cool paintings, like with dragons and I'm not going to just throw those away. Right. Like it's really insane to me. Um, and then growing up, uh, this was something that really hit me researching today and rewatching the documentary, Eye of the Beholder, is growing up, I never really thought about the artists behind uh, all these books that we read, like the AD&D books. And it was just part of the product. And you didn't really think, hey, somebody made this. Somebody actually had to like spend a lot of time and talent and effort to make these things. Right. And I, I think it really sheds light on the fact that there is this broader issue when it comes to artists especially music and visual where artists don't really get the credit that they deserve for the influence and impact they've had oh 100 percent. and i think a lot of times corporations are a big reason why because you have this idea of uh intellectual property right like right okay i'm gonna pay you to make this painting and then i own it and I think intuitively that just doesn't make sense. And we're not going to talk about IP too much today, but it really hit me today where I'm like, you know, I want to make more of an effort to know, not just in D&D, but in life, like who created this? Oh, yeah. We're surrounded by things that somebody had to conceptualize and write down and plan out and produce and, you know, make. Oh, man. And um, I, I really want to make more of an effort to credit We'll just call them creatives. I don't like that word, but credit the people who are making the stuff. Yeah. And there's another documentary. This is for a different episode, but called The Secret of Blackmore. Oh, I can't wait for that. Yeah, which is about Dave Arneson, who is the co-creator of D&D. And there's a lot of interaction online where people try to discredit Arneson and say he didn't come up with D&D. And I'm not going to get into it, but it's very clear that he was actually the guy who really fathered what we think of as role-playing games and, and Gygax was part of it, but not initially. And it's the same thing where you never hear about David Arneson. You'll only hear about Gygax. Yeah. And I think some of that was intentional because when D and D took off, apparently they were making a lot of money at first. Oh, I bet. Well, I mean in that initial like outset of it. Yeah. Yeah. But going back real quick, if you don't mind, I do mind to us. I'm just kidding. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it anyway. No, that I was actually, that, that was my initial thoughts on it. So going back to what you were just saying about getting to know, like watching this documentary affected me and seeing the art Mm -hmm. that I kind of grew up with. Like it really touched my heart, man. Like these artists Mm -hmm. and I don't know, like it's, it's a weird strain. It's a weird thing to talk about, but I, you know, it's more common than I think to be, emotionally affected by art like visually Mm -hmm. and I love that because when it started happening to me it didn't make sense I'd never experienced that and then watching this documentary and learning that there are literally stories of the art that like we consume so easily and so quickly this person that created it you know while they were creating this painting Mm -hmm. what was going on in their life that like shaped what that is Mm -hmm. and I loved it. I fell in love with like, oh, wow, I really want to do that that you were just talking about. I want to learn more about the, when I see a piece of art that inspires me, I'm like, I want to know more about who did this. Like, who are you? Like, what is your story? What's going on with you? Yeah. And it feels good to like really get into that and to feel that draw against fun because I remember feeling that draw when I got into music. Yeah. Wanting to like really be like, oh. Dive in deep dive in like because i loved metallica take for example so i learned their names i learned everything i could like about these people that made something Mm -hmm. that changed my life yeah and starting to like get that inspiration again to delve into that has been i don't know it definitely gets me all choked up seeing these artists like the ones that you were going to talk about like jeff easley Mm -hmm. jeff easley is a name that I've seen so many times when just looking at D and D stuff growing up and just being like, wow. Mm-hmm. And there's like a whole story 
from seeing this art that like jumps out at you and it's like oh who is that right what are they doing it's there's this whole you know thing yeah but jeff easley i was just like that is a name that's been iconic for me for so long and then to see a documentary and actually see him Mm -hmm. and hear him talk i was like it fulfilled this weird i don't even like know how to describe it fantasy of knowing oh my god it's jeff easley Mm -hmm. i wish i could i could meet this guy because his paintings have changed everything for me well i'm i'm sure you could if you went to like gen con right i'm sure he goes to the you know a lot of the uh the well-established conventions and and that that thing i think it's important to remember as even though it's social especially in the dm side it's really hand in glove for introverts Mm -hmm. and so much of it is about living in your head and building worlds internally similar to what an author does or a writer and it's nice to remember that oh there's a whole community of not just players but artists and writers and creators and business people that are attached to this this is you know D D and rpgs more widely is a culture there are real people behind those names jeff easley is not just a name it's a person yeah behind behind there and seeing them is different than just hearing this uh, prolific name like oh they have a face they have a they, their voice has a certain tone. They have a vibe. Just like, you know, Larry Elmore is a joy to listen to him talk because he's kind of got that southern twang going on, you know. <laughs> and that's that name right there. Again, Elmore, you see that on the bottom of so many of like my favorite book covers mm-hmm. or Spellfire cards or monsters or so much that you just seeing that person finally that has changed your life and you I didn't even know what he looked like. Mm-hmm. And then to see him and he's this older guy now, you know, he's in his 60s or 70s. Mm-hmm. And it brings my heart joy to see these artists that we've both grown up with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, for sure. I'm getting all choked up just thinking about it. Uh, uh, but it's interesting, um, easily specific. And I have a little for the, there's the four horsemen. We're jumping ahead a little bit, but during the what I'm calling the classical period, which is, AD and D and second edition and it starts around 1982 which is the year I was born to yeah, me too. tell you how old we are I wonder about that um, I gave them each a little title so Jeff Easley's the color guy if you look at his paintings it's all about this blending of colors and lots of reds and warmth to what he does that's awesome uh, Larry Elmore is the iconographer his stuff is iconic um, if you look at the cover of uh, Art and Arcana, you'll see the warrior like swiping out with a sword and there's a red dragon coming towards his perspective. Like he is the face of D&D, especially classic D&D. Mm. Um, Clyde Caldwell was the ladies man. He loved drawing the ladies. all the sexy ladies. Oh, yeah. He did a lot of other stuff too, but that's kind of, that was his thing. And then Keith Parkinson, who is my personal favorite of the four, was the master. He uh, studied Renaissance painting and really was into the technical aspect and always improving every painting was better than the last and he died really young yeah so he's he he's the only one that's not alive now i really loved seeing the four horsemen the three that are there Mm -hmm. talk about him yeah uh and then in this documentary that we watched his son is talking a lot about him and yeah uh seeing a lot of his art it again it's one of those moments where it it touched me to to see into that world and go, oh my God, like this is the son of some painter, this artist that I have loved so much mm-hmm. throughout my life. And now like getting it like sight into that and going, oh wow, he died. I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't know either. I mean, I watched Art and Arcana like a couple of years ago. And of course I told everybody in the D&D group, I was like, guys, this is awesome. And everyone's like, yeah. <laughs> Fuck Typical. you, I guess. Yeah. Um, but Ian, you were just talking about how some of these pieces of art will really, they just hit you in this way that sticks with you forever. Oh, yeah. And I mean, the Flying Citadel is one for me where I would just saw it once briefly and it just imprinted on my mind. But the other picture is the, it's Jeff Easley's portrait for the AD&D second edition player's handbook. And it shows this barbarian 
he's just bashed in a door and you're seeing him, he's kind of making this heroic pose. And that's what I've always pictured when I thought of Wolfgar. Oh, really? Always. Yeah, that was always the image in my head because he has kind of the wolf. I mean, he's bare chested, but he's got the wolf skin cloak. And I think he has an axe, but it kind of looks like a hammer. Hmm. And he's got like kind of the Viking helmet. And I didn't even realize that until today. Oh, really? That that is the image that I have floating around in my head. And again, it was just this natural association because one thing that uh, art of D&D is designed to be is evocative. Yeah. It's usually something is happening that's trying to tell a story. Something is going on. And so it always it's designed to grab your attention. So you'll buy those books because that's uh, just like a lot of the younger artists talked about in the documentary. The art was why you bought the book a lot of times because you're like, oh, and you'd see all these big full plate color images. And you're like, oh, I want to go on that adventure. Right. Holy shit. You know. Yes. So. Which one was the ladies' man? That's Clyde Caldwell. So Caldwell, I'm pretty sure, and I could be wrong, did this rendering, this painting of Takesis. Mm -hmm. And she's up there and Raceland is like held back Mm -hmm. in the foreground. Mm -hmm. That will always be this iconic, like, whether it's Lolth or Takesis or any of these evil gods of women, Mm -hmm. it's almost like this... I almost imagine that kind of look. Mm -hmm. And uh, like you said, it tells a story when I look at that picture. Every time I look at it, Mm -hmm. I feel inspired by it. I feel like, oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Think of like, I get 16 story ideas just from looking at that. Right. You want to start filling in the blanks and what's going to happen next because you're seeing this one moment in the action. Yeah. And like you're saying, I think that happens with a lot of that golden age from the original Four Horsemen. Mm -hmm. A lot of that stuff, like people don't realize how much there was nothing like that. Yeah. And I think that's a good cue to transition back to the beginning of the art. And one thing I didn't really, it kind of went over my head until I went back and listened or watched the doc again this week is all of this apparently goes back to Frank Frazetta. Oh, yeah. Which uh, most people know who Frazetta is. For me, my association growing up in Mormon Central in Utah was Frazetta was always kind of um, deviant a little bit. Like if you're looking at a Frazetta book, there's a bunch of like half-naked chicks in there and scantily clad. And so you're always kind of being bad or skirting the line, you know. But apparently... Once World War One happened, a lot of fantastical art fell by the wayside because people just didn't have the bandwidth for it or the patience for it or whatever. It kind of went went by the wayside, and Frazada, I guess, single handedly breathed new life into it. Right. And so, a lot of these artists that Ian and I are really influenced by are Frank Frazada is is the influence of them. Essentially, oh, yeah, he's like their god. Like Frank Frazetta was huge to them for sure. He's the OG, yeah. And I actually follow his daughter has a really cool Instagram account. Uh, she does a lot of work to like keep promoting his paintings and art and does charities and stuff. It's pretty cool. That is cool. But one thing I didn't realize is because Frazetta is really known for like Conan, for instance. Yeah, I was gonna say Conan imagery for sure. Yeah, Conan, but also. Uh, the John Carter of Mars yeah. series. So he did a lot of the John Carter art. And I was like, oh, that's true. I can remember a lot of those pieces. Oh, me too. Because I read a few of those books just like you did. Mm-hmm. I really love um, the way he would do the the Green Martians a lot. It was really cool. Oh, can I say something real quick? Go. I think that you'll find this because we're mentioning John Carter. One of the cities in the elves thing you're in is called Barum. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what they call Mars. It's close. Oh, uh, is it close? It's Barsoom. Barsoom. Mm-hmm. But that was like what, that's how I got that was that association mm-hmm. is that's how I named that was, I was like Barum. I was wondering why that sounded familiar. Yeah. It's Cause it's from John Carter. It was in- nice. influenced literally by that, that name. Mm-hmm. Like, cause I think I saw John Carter and I was like, Oh yeah. Bar- Barum. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And there was also uh, there was also a thing that I think Treebeard says as well. Oh, he he does braru. Yeah. So there's these braru. these two weird things that kind of influenced me to name that city Barum. Mm-hmm. So little fun thing for you. Nice. Yeah. Fun times. Fun things. Fun toots. So 
Frank, the story goes, from an art standpoint, sets this whole thing in motion in terms of fantastical art. And uh, going back to like the 50s and 60s, apparently, which if you think about Frank's art being big in the 50s, it must have been kind of scandalous because it was so good. Like you could tell he was highly trained. I honestly don't know much about Frazetta and I, I should, um, especially now knowing how influential he's been on other artists. Mm. But he sets this whole thing up and then we get into what we're calling the early period, which is just the beginning of D&D. So this is first edition and also original original D&D, which is the three brown books in the little box. Right. And you have first edition. And then you also have AD&D and you have the split because David Arneson won. Uh, Gary Gygax and David Arneson went to court and Arneson won. So by law, TSR had to pay Arneson royalties. So Gygax was like, well, I'm going to make advanced Dungeons and Dragons. So you had these two different versions of D&D you could play. Um, and, uh, so all during this period, right from the get go, the products are just super confusing. There's this whole thing that, uh, it's all tied in with the art where there's, and it's probably the reason why TSR doomed itself is there was too many products and no one was quite sure what you needed to actually play a lot of the time. Wow. But a lot of the artists from the early period, you could tell a lot of them were right out of high school. They were highly influenced by comic artists yeah. and and a lot of it looks very comic booky and it's a little less professional um, but you have uh, one of the most iconic pictures in d d to this day it's been kind of redone and different takes have been made on it is Dave Trampier's ad d player's handbook cover which is the idol where the thieves are trying to get the jewel out of the eye uh, yeah 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 so that comes from the early period you also have Errol Otis who did the cover to deities and demigods and his stuff almost has a Salvador Dali look to it. So everything is very abstract and weird and melty and oh, yeah, very cool yeah. when you look back at it. But you have, um, she, she only goes by Darlene. She was in the dock. Yeah. She does the map for Greyhawk, Greyhawk. dude. Yeah. It's crazy how big that map was. Um, but you have, uh, Dave Sutherland who actually will, these, a lot of these people will stick around for years and years. But they really kind of made their name in these eras. So Tom Wham, Tracy Leach, Jeff D, Jim Rosloff. And we have to remember, because we're not going to mention them much, all throughout the history of D&D, you have freelance artists. Oh, so you yeah. have amazing artists who will do one or two things here. They'll, they'll get signed on to do this project. So if we don't mention an artist and you're a big fan of D&D and you hear this, we, are, we apologize. There is literally an army of artists so many. associated with D&D. Oh, man. When they talked about that Greyhawk map, because I had <laughs> a fold out Greyhawk map. Nice. And looking back in my mind and seeing that and hearing this lady, Darlene, talk about how long it took her to make that and how intensive, like, cutting those pieces out and laying it down I was like wow that's so crazy because I thought that like looking back in my mind I hated that map mm -hmm. I thought it looked so clunky and weird because I also had a Faerun fallout fold out map and that one looked so good it's probably newer too like oh, it yeah. was produced more recently right. but I still now that I'm like as, as an adult looking at the Greyhawk map and seeing how it's made I'm like that's beautiful like that is right. incredible and I am so grateful that it existed mm -hmm. even though i may not have appreciated it back then well, and i think too i might be wrong about this but i think it was the first map of its kind i'm pretty sure yeah where it was this huge it was really big uh, it was a hex map i mean everybody listening should go watch the doc i will put a link uh in the doobly do it'll be to amazon prime because that's where you can watch it right now uh, you might be able to find it other places but i'm not sure where so when she made the map to actually give the different regions and kind of elevations color, she actually used this uh, transparent gel tape. Yeah. And she would have to tape it on to the map and then cut out the excess. And she still has the pe like the original pieces of like this translucent tape that she didn't use. It's pretty crazy. It's so cool to see. And she's, you know, she's older now. Like she's probably in her 60s. Yeah. So it's 
That's one of the cool things I loved about watching that documentary was there's still a lot of the people around that were part of the original stuff that really became huge for us growing up. Yeah. I mean, 2024 will be the 50th anniversary officially. That is so cool. So, I mean, we're we're just coming up on 50 years. So a lot of this history by today's standard seems like ancient history, but it's really not that long ago. Right. You know, a lot of these people are still around and a lot of them are still working. So like the four horsemen, I think have all retired. Yeah. But a lot of the other people like Brom, I'm pretty sure is still doing some stuff. He's still working. Brom's and so cool. So the early period is kind of this wild west. You can tell that they're trying to figure out what the look is. Yeah. And they're, you can tell there's not as much money to put into good paintings because a lot of the people writing the modules uh, like Dave Trampier are also making the art. So they're using who can actually draw or paint. Right. And then we get into the classical period and this is what's known as the golden age. Uh, this is, you have AD and D and second edition. It starts around 1982 and it goes till about 97 mm. right around there. So it's a big period. This is when you get the Four Horsemen, which we've talked about. Jeff Eastley. This is also when Dragonlance starts. Yeah. So you get this whole influx of creativity and new ideas into D&D, which D&D had, hadn't even been around for 10 years. And I feel like it also sets the precedent that like every eight years, they feel like they need to come out with a new edition, which I wish they would stop that. They don't need to <laughs> feel like they can slow down a little bit now. Uh, that's just me, though. Um, Brom was hired a little later. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know who Brom is, you should just look up Brom art and his stuff. Again, it's like Keith Parkinson. It, you can tell he is classically trained mm -hmm. because of the way his stuff looks. And it's very dark and just uh, has this visceral quality to it. One of my, it ended up being a top 13 because I couldn't do top 10. But um, there's a, there's two paintings by Brom. One's called Overlord. And it's from the Dark Sun campaign, and it's this dragon, and he, it's in profile, and he's pointing out, and it, the dragon looks undead, and uh, it's just phenomenal. It's another one of those paintings. I never had a book with it with this painting in it. I would just see it, like maybe in Dragon Magazine, and it really stuck with me. You get a lot of other good artists, though. You get uh, Tony D. Tirlitzi, and he did all the inside art for Planescape. Oh, for the Planescape stuff. And they're all these pencil sketches, and they're all kind of spiky and weird. Um, Ralph uh, Rupel did the very iconic cover of Planescape, and he's done some other really awesome paintings. But you have Ken Kelly, you've got John and Laura Lackey, uh, Tony, this is a Polish name, so, or Eastern Bloc name, uh, it's S-Z-C-Z-U-D-L-O, Skuzlo. 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 But he did all the um, art for Birthright. Oh, nice. Oh, I was going to say, so in the era that you're kind of talking about right now, that's when tons of like different campaign settings came out, like Ravenloft, Dragonlance. Uh, Forgotten Realms. You get uh, Forgotten Realms. A little later on in the 90s, you get Planescape, uh, Birthright, um, Dark Sun. Dark Sun. They're trying to do different. Uh, you get that al Qadim, I think. The Arabian one. The Arabian one, Legends of the Five Rings. Right. Also. Um, and there was quite a few that came out. Oh, Spelljammer? This whole period is when you get this explosion that even though it pretty much doomed TSR we get to reap the benefits because now it's kind of expected that you can play in all these different worlds mm -hmm. which is really cool and so basically TSR implodes in the mid 90s and they were actually rivals of Wizards of the Coast because they were trying to break into the collectible trading card uh, market there's a game that TSR came out with called Spellfire, which Ian still has a buttload of cards from. Yeah, and I was going to say, I mean, I don't know if we're allowed to, but I was going to take some pictures of just some spreads of different cards just to load them up so people could see them if they wanted. It should be fine. Cool. But basically, Wizards, I guess through a third party, ends up purchasing TSR in first, second quarter, 97. And this is really a sea change for D&D &D, uh, 
in every way possible, but we're just going to talk about the art. Like, it's a completely different look if you look at, like, ADD 2nd Edition and the late era stuff they were doing before uh, TSR implodes. And then 3rd Edition, totally different. Yeah. Like, the design. And I have to say, not the art, but the design of the books of 3rd Edition, I fucking hate. I hate them so bad. They're so ugly to me. Are they the ones that look like... They look like they're supposed to be physical books right. with, like, clasps. Yeah. So ugly, man. Don't like it. I, I do like them when I look at them, but I also think that's a weird choice. Really weird. Like, yeah. it's like, mm, I see what you're going for, and if you would have put more money into it so it wasn't just a picture, it actually was kind of like the book like that. Right. Now you're on to something that I think... so. I like the idea, but execution. But think about having, if it was a real book with a clasp, you're supposed to have three of these, right? Right. Player's Handbook, Dungeon Master Guide, Monster Manual. Carrying those around, nightmare. Oh, yeah. Nightmare. For sure. But again, my my image is always like AD&D 2nd Edition. Those are RPG books. Right. Oh, I'm into that. I know 4th Edition is really maligned, but I love the design of 4th Edition. So I'd have to see it because I don't even know what it looks like. We'll look at it. It's very, the, the logo, like the design of the books, the art, I think it's great. So early modern era, again, this is 97 to about 2000... 14. Okay. Um, you get the new horseman. So we were talking about Todd Lockwood, but also Sam Wood, who I think was the lead designer, a lead artist of the four. John uh, Scheidenet. <laughs> Brutal. <laughs> Looks like a German name. So S A S C H I N D E H E T T E. Scheidenet. Scheiden. Yeah, Scheidenet. 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 Schadenfreude. Schadenfreude. And then Don Murin. But again, you have some other artists like Henry Higginbotham, Wayne Reynolds, William O'Connor, Dan Scott, a bunch of freelance artists, people who did one-offs. And Wayne Reynolds will become very prominent in the next portion. You're going to see his art everywhere. Um, You can tell that Wizards is trying to set D&D apart and, and visually say, hey, we're doing something new with this. We're breathing new life into this. And you get this proliferation of not just books from wizards, but you also get a bunch of third party books. So you get sword and sorcery and you get um, the SRD. So this is the first time wizards releases just the basic rules open to anybody can use them for free and make spinoff modules. Oh. And that's actually why 3.5 was made because they're like, oh, we don't like this. We want to make all the money. Ah. So then they make 3.5 because they want to get rid of the SRD. But once they did that, it was kind of like opening Pandora's box. And now there's SRD for pretty much every rule set out there. You have a lot of good artists the early modern era is not my personal favorite, but I love a lot of the character designs because you have like, they started having these certain characters, like there's a certain warrior that you see on all the different product lines. Okay. And there's a certain elf wizard called, uh, I think, Meili. Um, it's always the same character. There's always a dwarf fighter that you see, or a dwarf might be a cleric. So they started having kind of this archetypal party. They started doing novels and they rebirthed the chainmail miniature game that uh, our friend John, who we talk about a lot, he is a big fan of that. He used to play it with another one of our associates a lot of the time. So I don't have as much to say about the the third edition era, but some of these artists are really good, like Todd Lockwood especially. Third edition through fourth edition, I was really not checked into what was going on as far as the game goes but i still loved the art so i would see things and right i'd look and go oh wow that's really cool and like kind of thumb through them and see the new era of kind of the art that's happening and again it was just seeing all of this almost revamped versions of you know like the dragons and i think there's a certain era where two artists really delve into like shaping what how each kind of color of dragon has a different look. That's Sam Wood and Todd Lockwood. They're the ones who define. And I like the way, especially the uh, the metallic dragons look. Mm. I like that more cat-like look to them. Yeah, it's cool, yeah. For sure. Um, 
With third and fourth, I, I really didn't know too much about it other than what you've kind of told me about it. Mm-hmm. I, I actually played quite a bit. It wasn't anything long term. And I also, that's when I started getting into World of Darkness and Exalted and a lot of these other rule systems, which also have phenomenal art, especially uh, Werewolf the Apocalypse. So it's the first edition. I love that art. It's much more kind of illustrative and more like comic book art but it's phenomenal oh i loved that art too we had that yeah card game the the art in that and the card game is actually a bit different it's more paintings the art in the actual yeah. book is all black and white it's all line work oh really okay yeah it's really cool but uh third edition had a lot of cool character stuff but the for me and i'm a big book design fanatic mm. wasn't really something i ever decided on like this is what i'm gonna do i just i like a well-designed book third edition just it felt a little lackluster i'm sure there's a lot most people would disagree because i love the design of fourth edition and fourth edition is i think hate it is probably putting it mildly <laughs> like people really hate it and so you get a lot of cool stuff you get a lot of innovations like the way the dragons look um has pretty much stuck around yeah they, they still have this feel you get a bunch of cool books like the dragonomicon the book of nine swords and you get oh yeah this huge book bloat going on and and i mean that in a positive way um yeah and then we get into the modern era which is really from 2014 15 to now we could go back a little bit farther than that you could say like 2012 so right around where fourth edition comes in mm-hmm. and uh, don't remember what I was going to say. But you start <laughs> getting uh, this different look with 4th edition. And it's really, I didn't realize this again until today. It's really this one artist named Wayne Reynolds. He's got this more blocky style and it's very highly, highly stylized. You're getting away from this uh, realism that you get in the Golden Age mm. with the artists like Easley and the the four horsemen much more comic booky and blocky and if you look at anything from pathfinder it's most likely wayne reynolds has done it and so he's very prolific as well he does a lot of work and has a very distinct look that really started with fourth edition um you also had william o- o'connor um and there's a guy named ralph horsley or horsley i'm not sure how you pronounce it it's h-o-r-s-l-e-y so it could go either way um, there's a cover called Into the Unknown, and it's just another It's another phenomenal cover. It's really cool looking. And uh, then you have some other artists like Michael Cormark, uh, Jesper Ising, uh, who do at least, they may have done more work than this, but you see a couple of their works pop up here and there. Mm. When you get to 5th edition, you get some of the, I don't know, some of my favorite art of all time and the the one to really talk about is tyler jacobson Mm. and he's one of my probably all-time favorite artists and if you look at the player's handbook or you look at volo's guide to monsters or the dmg all of that is his oh that stuff's so great yeah a lot of the covers that you see or like the the dm screen um is tyler jacobson and there's one there's two actually of his in particular that I love, which is one is uh, Zucked Moy's Wedding, and it show it she's this demon queen of fungi basically, and it's it's a side shot of her going to marry. I don't even know who she's marrying. Zublex or Ublex or whatever. Yeah, uh, Zublex. Yep. Yeah, uh, that's just one of my favorite of his, and then also uh, Demogorgon versus Drist oh. is just awesome. Really, really cool. Let's. I want to, you just said that real quick. So I'm going to talk about that because this is art related. Mm-hmm. Over the years, Drizzt being illustrated, there have been some iterations that I look at it and go, what is this? Even there's a Larry Elmore painting that I just, the way he makes Drizzt look is just horrible. He looks like this old grandpa man. Yeah. I'm like, what is this? Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite ones of Drizzt, Drizzt is the cover of Crystal Shard, uh, which is like one of the first times. Oh, the old one. Yeah, like, because it's him like inspecting that blood trail, you know? Yeah. And then there's that picture that Wolfgar is right there. And that for me Mm -hmm. has been my Wolfgar is with that big wolf head thing. And 
Yeah. But that's such a great picture of what I always imagined Drizzt, Drizzt looking like. The one, are you talking about the the cover of The Legacy? That's one of them. That's not the Easily one. The Easily one is much more, like you get a perspective, but the that one is horrible too. Yeah. That one is so bad. horrible. There's one that's the Starless Night and it almost looks like a photograph. Yeah. It's very real, realistic. Yeah. And it's got Cadabry and Drizzt on the front and good Lord, I I don't know what. I don't know what they were thinking. Yeah, I don't know where you were pulling your idea of elves from. Like, because Cadabry looks more like an elf than Drizzt does. It seems like there was this, Terrible. like the artists doing the doing Drizzt for some reason, either because Drow were, were supposed to be evil or because they're so long lived. It's like they wanted to make him look like an old man yeah. or something. There's something weird it's about it. Brutal. There are some still modern ones of Drizz that, that are so great to me mm-hmm. that I've seen. I was like, wow, that's really cool. A lot of them are Jacobson's too. A lot of the defining portraits are his. That's really cool. But Drizz it through the years has been a, a journey. I remember being young and seeing the cover of like Legacy and Starless Night and just being horrified yeah. going what did you do to my boy? I am not finding the name of the artist for that picture of the crystal shard but I'll find it and put it in the doobly doo cuz uh, cool. we want to credit that artist but that's a good one for sure. Yeah, that I love that one and I'll post up some of the pictures I have of these Spellfire cards cuz sure. a lot of it is just like the one you love, the Citadel. Mm-hmm. There's a few Spellfire cards where they just chopped off a piece of it and they're like, "Oh, this is that thing and then here's another part of that same painting and that's this thing." And mm-hmm. so it's really fun to see like how they chopped up paintings. Yeah to like label different things because then you're like oh i recognize this and you know it's from this other painting right right. that painting is in this card as well yeah so tyler jacobson very good the other one and she might just be my favorite artist like she's so fucking talented it's ridiculous is anato finn stark and that is her online name She's very private, so you can't find out much info about her, but she's also self-taught, and her stuff, she does a bunch of work for Magic the Gathering. She does a bunch of reinterpretation of, like, uh, The Witcher and Berserk and all these really highly lauded IP, and her stuff is just so good, and she can do so many different styles. One of her big features was the special edition of Fisben's Treasury of Dragons is hers. Oh, I have that. Yeah, the two dragons that kind of make the yin-yang. Yeah. That's one of hers, and when she started getting more into this kind of almost stained glass flat look to it, and I just love her. She has done a lot of stuff in, like, Strixhaven, but she does more Magic the Gathering than D&D, so that's the big one that she's done. That's awesome. And then there's a bunch of artists, uh, really quick, I know you're going to jump in, but... Oh, no, yeah. no you're good. William O'Connor, Kieran Yonner, uh, again, Michael Cormack, and Jason Rainville. And then I just have down here, honorable mentions is Pathfinder, first and second edition, which again is Wayne Reynolds. So it's like all his stuff. When you mentioned that, I literally was at my local game store mm-hmm. just yesterday, and I picked up... Mm-hmm. Uh, Pathfinder rule book and I'm pretty sure it's second edition because it's probably this whatever's new mm-hmm. and just flipping through it I had the urge to just buy it yeah even though we don't play Pathfinder and we might not play it for a long time it the art and the setup of that book I'm like this is real really good. cool yeah and then I looked down and there was the Starfinder book and I was like mm, let me look look at that flip it open that one's really good too oh look at this stuff yeah. and then Pathfinder has this thing where like you can get a lot of their books in smaller paperback or the bigger hardback. Yep. And I think that that's awesome. So I grabbed one of the little tinier paperback ones and flipped through it. And it was the one of it's like guns and something. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I flipped through that and I was like, literally just from the art and kind of the way it looks, I was like, I want to play this fucking yeah, game. Yeah. Like I want to play Pathfinder or Starfinder or both. Like I want to play these. Mm hmm. Uh, they seem really interesting and super like hardcore about a lot of the rules. You know what I mean? Like crunchy as shit. Oh yeah. 
Well, again, it's just, it's 3.5 continued. Like 3.5 never really stopped. It's just that it turned into Pathfinder. Um, And I, that's actually, I have the first edition core rule book in that small size. Oh, really? Because it's, yeah, it's like two thirds of the price. So you get, it's a good deal. Yeah. And it is really nice that Pathfinder does that. I wish um, Wizards would do that. I think they would sell more. Yeah. And again, like my wanting to play this was literally looking at the art, flipping mm-hmm. through it, seeing the way that the pages are set up. The art of this game makes me feel like, oh man, I really want to play this. Seeing just a few of the classes that you can play and the art to display those, I was like, yeah, I want to play this. That's why I like a well-designed book. Like the Pathfinder books are really like you open them up and you're you're motivated to keep opening them up and keep looking through them and keep yeah. referencing to them just because they feel good. They have a weight to them, the fonts they choose, the color layouts, the art. And again, I'm just super impressed with Wayne Reynolds because most of the art you see is his. And that's a lot. That's so much art. It's a lot of art. So props to him. D&D art is super awesome and should check it out. Again, it it has influenced every single thing. Right. I mean, everything. World of Warcraft, like Blizzard things, anything that's come from that. Lord of the Rings in a way. Uh, so much. Especially the art of it and yeah. there wasn't really fantastical art right. and then you got this influx and I'm sure if you talk to like John Howe who's a Lord of the Rings artist who worked on the Lord of the Rings trilogy you would find a lot of cross influences between the two you know. Absolutely. Getting into the art of D&D and learning more a little bit about this through this podcast and learning this subject it makes me want to learn more. Yeah. And delve into these artists and appreciate what their story is and how they brought this to us and how they got to where they are now. Because there's so much about that that lends to appreciating the art. Mm -hmm. For me, it really has touched me a lot deeper knowing this, these stories of these people that have changed my life. And I didn't never even knew what they looked like until recently. So... Go show an artist some love. Yeah. Go appreciate their art. Let them know that it's affected you if it has. I think it's the takeaway. So. Yeah. And as artists, I'm sure we can tell you we may not react well to it sometimes, but we do love hearing if somebody was actually moved or something affected them that we've made. Yeah. It's 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 a it's an awesome thing to feel. So definitely reach out to those people. Let them know. There's nothing worse as a creative than indifference Mm. where you're not getting any reaction. Yeah. It's not negative reaction. It's no reaction. So if you are affected by a piece of art, let the artist know. They'll appreciate it. They will. So uh, do you have any final words, Ian? My final words are Zucked Boy, Mm -hmm. Burn, Typewriter, and Flag. It's not a CIA code. Just want to put that out. Nope. It's not a CIA code. Not CIA code. Not secret government code. We haven't activated the sleeper agents. Well, my name is Jacob. You're Jeffrey. Phil M. Steam. Share Jeremy. You don't even remember. It's Jeremy. No, you don't know. My name's Jacob. Don't believe the hype. Fuck. And uh, we uh, we hope you've enjoyed this broadcast of Philo Mafia F- Podcast. What? Powd Coast. Oh, God. Go appreciate some artists and stay sweaty. Stay sweaty. Like, share, subscribe.